Welcome to the Develop Leadership uh, Seminar. Uh, we are so excited that you have decided to take a time out of your busy schedule uh, mm -hmm. to come here and learn, uh, to participate, to engage, to dialogue, because that is what this is. This isn't meant to be a lecture, mm -hmm. though there are segments of it that will be lecture-esque. Uh, there will be spaces throughout the time to dialogue with the table um, around you. And so uh, that's going to be an invitation for you to, to do as we uh, go through our time together. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we begin um, is the bathrooms. If you go out uh, down the hallway to your left, that is uh, where you'll be able to find those for you. There is, this is super informal, so please throughout the whole time grab, uh, grab some water, grab some coffee, grab some uh, desserts as you please, super informal uh, in that way. Please uh, devour all of the candy at your table. Uh, if, there, if, you, if you eat all no of the Kit Kats at mm -hmm. your table, you can go and steal from another person's table if that is something that you, you need uh, for, to help get you through the evening. So permission to steal and this one time only. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> you're welcome. Because you need Kit Kats, right? Yeah, yes, I do. I'll make sure I, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll drop. Actually, I think I go go steal from a table and okay. then put them right here. Thank you. Just for you. Uh, well, my name is Tony Villafane. I am the pastor of students and leadership development. If I hadn't had the privilege of meeting you yet um, and uh, getting to lead and facilitate these seminars is such a delight and passion for myself. Uh, and then to have uh, really incredible guests like... This man right here. Would you introduce yourself? That uh, who you are yeah, and what okay, you're about. Sure. My name is Todd, and and everybody knows I'm Tony's personal assistant. Okay. There you go. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, have you fired me? Is that why I'm not? I haven't fired you. <laughs> oh, no. okay. All right. Well, I'm your personal assistant. Man. This, so, and I'm ready to go. This is. I'm. I feel awkward. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> I'm listening. Well, here we are. Uh, I am super, I'm, I'm jazzed up. We got a lot of really good content for you. You have a packet that's in front of you. You're like, wow, this is really thick. Uh, it's a lot. But we also, here's kind of the hope with these seminars. We want to give you uh, bite-sized content while we also kind of want to give you a fire hose to some degree. Why? Because we don't believe that learning takes place in these two-hour increments. We believe that goes when you go home and you get to look over this packet on your own, you get to debrief over it with maybe a friend or a coworker if you're here with someone, or uh, there's, there's some tips. They're like, oh, like, this was really good, but I want, to, I want to keep listening, and I want to go and check this out later. This packet is here for you to go and decompress over in the days and the weeks to come because we do fully believe that in this seminar you're going to get some really, really practical tips on how to uh, actively listen as we look at really the topic today is building interpersonal team synergy. And you're like, well, that, is, that is like a mouthful of words to be able to use uh, just to say, hey, we want to learn how to do team well with excellence and as we lean our ear in to our teammates, to our friends, to our family members, this is not just for teams, this is for your family. This is for your friends, this is for your church, this is for uh, any, any person that you come in contact with that we are looking to build an interpersonal where it's about people, uh, team synergy, where there, where there are two things, two or more things acting together in unity, uh, in synchronization is what we are looking to do in this seminar. Uh, lastly, before I hand it over to Todd to start, is uh, some of you, like myself, really, really love structure, schedule, where are we going, why are we going, et cetera, et cetera. So for, the, for you in the room, here is our roadmap for our whole evening together. Uh, so every time we get to a new section, we will re-highlight this roadmap as we unpack what is active listening, why do we think it's a critical leadership quality, but really we want to make an appeal to you about that. What's the difference between hearing and listening? Is there a difference? How does empathy play in? What's at verbal active listening, but then what's also non-verbal active listening? And then we want to get practical with some uh, actual practice time that we could have here and then, and then land the plane with some tips and tricks. And so that's where we're going. You guys ready? Right. Yes, sir. I'm ready. All right. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we dive in? So Jesus, we give this space, we give this time, we give our minds, we give our intellect, we give our hearts to you. No better hands to hold them than yours. May you be honored in this time. May we take everything that we are and lay it right at your feet. 
Mm. Here to listen, mm. here to learn, mm. here to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for that intro, Tony. Really, really appreciate that. So what is active listening? Since we're leaders, I think today we're really going to encourage and stretch one another in regards to what is, what is active listening. So as you have on page one, active listening is the ability to mentally and emotionally Usually when we hear the word listening, active listening, we're used to hearing the word mentally, you know, to, to think about it, but we're not used to hearing this word when it comes to active listening. But we're leaders, and I think we're all capable of, of going, going here. And I, and I believe probably most of us or all of us are maybe even kind of good at, at doing that. And well, what happens as leaders if we come, become even better at that? But what we want to do when it comes to active listening is to think about how can I mentally and emotionally connect with the speaker? That, that's very important. So what I'm doing is I'm listening to understand and I'm listening to connect, no, no matter what type of conversation I'm, I'm involved in. So, as we think about this, active listening, next, active listening is not only what we listen to, but also what we see that backs up what we are listening to. As all of us are going to be real, it's going to be very important as we are real and honest with one another, and we know when we're talking to people, and sometimes the person might be backing away just a, a little bit. They're getting their car keys out. And if a person is not a, a, a real good active listener, they may not pick up on that. And, and maybe they're backing away because they have to leave or maybe because uh, our breath might be a little too, too strong. But it's going to be very important for all of us to look at our lives and say, where in the world do I need to grow so I can connect not just mentally, but emotionally with someone. And so Tony is going to help us to think through that. And I think we have a question here. So in regards to this table talk, did you want to come on up here and yeah, take care absolutely. of that, sir? So the question we want to ask is, who is someone in your life that embodies listening well? So we want to give you a space to kind of get multiple questions through our time together. If you haven't mm -hmm. been to one of these before, multiple times we're going to pause, break, give mm -hmm. you a chance to talk. Here's number one. Mm -hmm. Who is someone who in your life embodies listening well? Mm -hmm. Second question. Mm -hmm. On a scale of one to ten, how difficult slash easy is it for you to listen? Mm -hmm. So moment of honesty. On a scale of one to ten, how easy or how difficult is it for you? And maybe even why. Take three minutes and discuss these two questions. Go. Okay, so in, um, in answering that second question on a scale of 1 to 10, how easy or difficult is it for you to listen, um, I'm, I'm hoping that in answering that question, that there, there isn't a, whether it's, if, it's, if you be honest it's a low number, that it isn't necessarily a discouragement. And if it's a really high number, I'm, not, I'm hoping it's not necessarily like, oh, like, look at me, I know exactly what I'm doing. Because the fact of the matter is, is that we all are continual learners and how we listen well, and how we engage with the people around us, be it our spouse, be it our team member, be it the person that is below us, that we're leading, the boss above us. There's always ways that we can continue to learn and to grow. And so the hope is that no matter where you put yourself on a 1, 3, 7, 10, 6.89, whatever the number may be, uh, that you are saying, hey, I'm here to learn and to grow and say, hey, I, I, I want to get better. Uh, I want to get better for my team. I want to get better for my kids. I want to get better for, for Jesus. And so what is that posture going to look like as we go? Because today, uh, as we dive in, we're looking at this, and I'm calling it a critical leadership quality. That listening is a critical leadership quality quality. The, the, the thing I would like to submit for your consideration is this, a couple more blanks for you to be able to fill in, is that active listening is a critical leadership quality that is vital to the success 
of a leader who aspires toward profound levels of organizational and relational impact. So we have two different elements I'm highlighting here at the very end is that you, we are aspiring towards profound levels of organizational, so that is team, that is the job in which you work in, the position in which you serve in uh, at, at a church, uh, an organizational in that way, but it's also relational in, in the home with a friend group, with the person that you are trying to mentor and spend time with, or the person that you're trying to be mentored by, that there is this business organizational side of this conversation while also simultaneously there is this relational uh, uh, part to it. Now, organizational and relational, obviously they blend together and they ought to be, but we are, again, kind of trying to highlight two different elements of this. And so to say it's a critical leadership quality, why do I say that? Because I would say this, is that a, a bunch of things that we, we could sit on these uh, next 12, 15 bullet points for a long time, but just to highlight them real quickly, is here's what I would say, is that... Uh, for, for the critical leadership quality that is active listening, I would say it, it, when you practice it, when you are intentional with it, when you are diving into this skill set, it's flexing your emotional intelligence. Uh, it's flexing the ability to sit with the person and say, okay, what's the emotion coming out of this person right now or the environment in which I, in which I sit, sit in? Uh, it's flexing problem solving, the ability to not just have a cookie cutter answer to every single thing that you interact with or person that you are with. It flexes your self-awareness, uh, your, your ability to know, okay, am I listening to my own body? Am I listening to my own mind and emotions? It flexes your intentionality. Uh, and it, it flexes your humility, because what is listening doing? It's posturing yourself to the other person uh, rather than yourself, which we really like posturing toward our own self, don't we? It flexes our comprehension skills. It flexes the ability to, to say, okay, so what, what I'm hearing you say is this, and it's being able to recount what the person had said or what you had just listened to in a sermon, seminar, class, etc. cetera. Uh, it flexes uh, your likability. <laughs> if you're someone who only never, he, ne that he or she never listens to the person, um, you're probably not going to be that liked, <laughs> just saying. And so, to, so it flexes your likability and then your empathy. We will also dive into that in a little more detail in a moment. How about for others? So that was yourself, but how about for others? If you are practicing active listening, how about for others? It builds your credibility. It builds your credibility in the sense of, man, like this person cares. This person shows value towards me, and I want to keep listening to them. It builds camaraderie. If we are, if, if I am a siloed over here, and there's, and someone's a silo over there, and we're just kind of doing everything, that's not camaraderie. That's individualism. Uh, so to be able to say we are doing this together is camaraderie. It shows value, and it shows care. Uh, it can, not saying it always does, but it can reduce anxiety and depression. The ability to sit with someone and say, I see you, I hear you. Have you ever been there before? Where your anxiety was, was decreased because someone was present with you. Like truly present. I know for me I have. Sets the example for them to model. I hope that we are all leaders and influencers who say, hey, I want to set the example, not in the name of perfectionism, but just in the name of trying to do this thing right and well and with excellence. And so we're trying to set the example for them. And then finally, uh, let's think about your team. So we, we said yourself, we said others. Now let's think organizationally or team-wise. It provides deeper levels of trust and dialogue, uh, the ability to actively listen with each other and build synergy in that way. It, it builds uh, deeper levels of trust. It increases synergy and unity. We're going to throw the word synergy out quite a bit along with unity. Uh, allows change to happen more fluidly. Uh, an organization that listens to each other and it bends your ear to the other it has this has this sense of hey we're gonna we're gonna lean in together we're gonna change together we're not gonna be rigid together uh, produces more effective results uh, decreases misunderstanding and miscommunications and and we all know that when we choose not to listen you've probably been there before on the receiving end when you said something to a boss you said something to a friend you said something to a parent and they didn't hear you with what you were trying to communicate maybe you said it exactly but it just went over their head or maybe they just thought you said something and really you said something else or maybe you were on that receiving end of you thought someone said something else and you just misunderstood I think we've all been there. In fact, I know we've all been there. 
So when we actively listen, when we're trying to build this interpersonal team synergy, when we're leaning into this concept, what are we doing? We are choosing to say, I'm gonna, I want to decrease misunderstandings. I want to increase synergy and understanding. There's a quote uh, by Wayne Mack that says this, studying how to be a good listener is part of the core curriculum of God's school of lifelong learning. I love this simplicity of this quote uh, because I'm a nerd. Um, and I love that the idea of school, I don't love school, but I love the idea of learning and curriculum and choosing to sit uh, in God's schools to say, I'm going to learn how to listen. Because didn't we see Jesus model that? Look at the life of Jesus. How well did he, he model listening to people, interacting with others? So we're going to do this as well. And then lastly, this other, uh, this other quote that says, Ultimately, when we listen and truly hear, it is not only about how we can serve our partners in a more meaningful way. It is about making space for new voices and perspectives to influence and shape more, uh, more just and equitable societies where all young people can thrive. This is a specific quote towards uh, a demographic, but I think that the principle is absolutely true. That it provides space for multiple voices perspectives, and I think that we shouldn't be in a silo of, our, of the voices that influence our life. Diversity, multiple voices to be able to speak into us where we're listening, I think, is key. Now, uh, critical thinking is just as important, that we're not just receiving anything that someone says without any lens of, of, of uh, trying to see, testing it to see if it's true or not. But are we still choosing to have multiple voices and perspectives to influence and shape our lives? Uh, and so as we kind of venture back to our roadmap now, uh, again, we've said that we want to define active listening. We want to say this is a critical leadership quality as we move forward to, to submit for your consideration. And now we, uh, Todd wants to unpack a little bit of what is hearing versus listening. Okay, the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing, uh, it, it looks pretty too well educated to me. You know, the physiological process of detecting the sounds in our environment, the outer ear captures the sound, and the inner ear is what translates that sound into vibrations, period. The next part of that is really listening. The brain interprets the frequency into meaningful noise. L let me explain the difference between hearing and listening. So you have, uh, this might be a little difficult to see here, but uh, you, you have the, the eye, all right, and over here you have the, the, the ear. And if you can't see it, it's because I had too much to eat for Thanksgiving, and so I'm, I'm working on that and so forth. All right. So when, when, whenever something comes through the eye or here or through the ear, I know this might be difficult, but... Uh, I will, I'll explain if you can't see this too well. When so, whenever something comes through the, the eye, I'm not going to say too much about the eye because we're talking about listening, or, or through the ear. The first place that it goes to is something called the amygdala. It always goes to the amygdala first, and then it goes to the cortex. Let me give you a good example. You're, you're out here, you're walking, going for a walk here, having a good time, and all of a sudden you hear a twig crack. What happens is your heart goes up a little bit because the amygdala says, the amygdala is emotional. Amygdala says, whoa, be alert. And you're thinking, is that a snake? And then because all the information goes to the amygdala first, secondly, that information, that the twig goes to the cortex, and the cortex says, no, it's just a twig, calm down. 
No problem. So when we hear something, it goes here first. There's, there's usually an emotional response that's very, very important. And, and this is why it's important, because now we're going to see the difference between he, I'm going to see the difference between hearing and listening and how God designed this. A few reasons we struggle only to hear. One reason is if a person has unhealed trauma. And, and, and this is why. Because anything that you hear, it comes through, it goes to the amygdala. So let's say you leave... You leave a church because someone said something really nasty to you about your kids. And then you come to Gateway and you see that person again here. What happens is you are triggered. And we're going to talk about in a few seconds what you're triggered with. But, but you're triggered. And so whatever that person says, guess what? You're probably not going to hear so people can have unhealed trauma, and because of that, it's hard for them to hear. It's hard for them maybe to, to like, uh, and I shouldn't write it because you won't be able to see it and so forth, uh, but th th they may struggle with authority. So keep that in mind as leaders, as, as we're talking to people, whether at work or in leadership. If someone has some unhealed trauma, uh, it may be hard for them to hear. A family learned behavior, maybe mom or dad, or mom and dad, they, they were talkers. And all they, they, they were godly people, but, but they, they were talkers. And very rarely did they ever stop talking. You, you know, there are certain people, there are wonderful people, but they just keep talking and talking and talking and talking. And some of us, we just learned that from from mom or dad. That's just the way it is. Or it may be our personality. But that's a reason why we, we just hear. We just hear and, and so forth. Uh, next, emotional unhealthiness. If, if I offend Phil over here, I mean, I really offend him, I say something to him, probably if he doesn't say anything, when I'm around Phil, Phil can't listen to me because there is too, and we're coming to this word, the reason why we really can't hear, but there's too much stuff up here. There's too much pain. Maybe Phil does have some emotional unhealthiness. He's not dealing with it. But when someone hurts us and we don't deal with it, we don't like being around them. And so it's important to remember that as leaders, as we're spending time helping people, developing people, and we know two people are not getting along, maybe one person isn't hearing because of that. And, and the fourth, there are many reasons. We're going to discuss fourth. But cortisol. Now, this is very important because, now remember this? Whenever something happens to us, oops, uh, I will accidentally hit that. When, when, when wow, I really hit, I, re, I really hit that. Okay, when, when, whenever something happens to us, there is an emotional response. But if it's a negative, if it's a negative response, the brain, the brain, the body fills with cortisol. Cortisol is what causes anxiety and is what causes depression. So when something, we hear something or see something, that, that's negative. But, but since we're talking about listening, when we hear something that's negative, we automatically get cortisol. Now, one way to kind of deal with that, of course, is, is through Scripture. But when people have, when people have been hurt for all types of ways, they have this cortisol, as I said, it leads to anxiety, it leads to depression, and because of that, it can be too hard to hear and really difficult to listen. So if there, and there are many other, there are many other reasons, but if we've learned things from mom and dad, you know, we've learned not to, to listen well, just to hear, or if there's unhealed trauma, you know, or, or if we're just talking 
too much, and we may be godly people where we're not picking up on, on signs or if there's emotional unhealthiness, if all that is going on, but anything that we hear that's negative, God, because, and, and there, now there are really good reasons why this happens. You think, boy, negative things happen and cortisol comes? Now why is that? Well, we're not here to answer that question, okay? Um, maybe another time. But, but this floods. And so one main reason that people, all of us, struggle to hear no matter what is because of this is flooding us. And so it's important to understand how to get rid of anxiety, how to get rid of stress, and, and so forth, because that can do a lot of damage to us. All right? I would really love to keep going on and on there, but we are going to stop at that part because that was, that was fun. <laughs> okay. So listening. So a, as we think about listening, it's a mental and emotional process. A mental and emotional process. We tend to think of listening as it's, it, it's a mental process. Yeah, it, it is a mental process, but it's a mental and emotional process of making meaning from the sounds that we hear. What is the meaning associated from what we are hearing? How do I mentally comprehend what is being said to me? How do I feel <coughs> Excuse me. what is being said to me? How do I develop a deeper understanding? I need a drink here. <laughs> develop a deeper understanding of what is being said. You, you see, when, you, when we have these issues, we're, we're not going to be listening to someone and saying, man, how can I develop a deeper understanding of what she is saying? How can I feel what she is saying? How, how can I hear what he is saying? <clears throat> Notice that the eye keeps twitching. I've never noticed that before. You, you, you see, when, when we really hear someone, when, when we don't have, you know, when we don't have all those issues that, that we need to, to work through, when, when we deal with all that, we're really able to hear. So sometimes the truth of the matter is, sometimes it's not the speaker, sometimes it's just us. Sometimes it's our own issues, just, just sometimes. But you, all of you are leaders, so you know that and, and so forth, all right? Okay, now, table talk here. At your tables, how often do I struggle to emotionally connect with people as I listen to them? Why might this struggle, why might this be a struggle for me? How often do I struggle to emotionally connect with people as I listen to them? Why might this be a struggle for me. And think about it. And if it's not often, that might be good. Like maybe like for maybe 95% of the time is not a struggle. So how about the 5% of the time? What, 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 what is it, the 5% of the time, that keeps us from emotionally connecting with people as we listen? All right? Have fun in your groups enjoying that question. Where? So, hey, well, let's keep on going because we could sit on this question for a very long time. Uh, so maybe you um, take a picture of that question if you want to go talk about it with your boss or your spouse or your kids or I don't know, but uh, that question is, it's a good one. Thanks, Todd, for crafting that specifically. Um, I can compliment when, I, when something's good in this seminar because I know it's not mine. Um, so here we go. Let's keep on going into empathy. 
uh, empathy really actually has a bit to do with uh, the question that we were just processing for a few minutes because uh, empathy is so needed in the conversation of listening, of hearing, of interpersonal team synergy. So let's kind of unpack a little bit of what it actually is. Uh, baseline uh, empathy is the ability to understand and be sensitive to another person's feelings, thoughts, and actions. Simplistically put, 30,000 foot, we're going to zoom in, is that it's the ability to understand, to be sensitive to another person's feelings, thoughts, and actions. Um, there, another definition that I personally love um, is this one. It's the ability to abandon your world and step into the world of the person across from you. Empathy is the ability to say, okay, you know what, yeah, I, I'm going to abandon what's going on in Tony's world, and I'm going to go step into this, the world of the person across from me, and I'm going to embrace the feelings, I'm going to embrace the reality, I'm going to embrace the logic, I'm going to embrace the, the, the joys, I'm going to embrace what is this person feeling in this moment, to abandon your world and to step into the world of the person across from you. Now let's, let's take it one step further now. Uh, an empathetic leader um, is one who has a genuine interest in her or his team members' lives, the challenges they face, and their overall feelings. Now, there are some people in this room that would say, Man, Tony, that sounds great, but I really don't do emotions well. I, I, I don't know how you want me to do other people's emotions well when I can't even figure out my own, or I don't even like my own emotions, or I like to act like they don't exist, or like, I don't know how you expect me to do this. I see you, and I validate you. Emotions are tough. <laughs> they are tough. Because one moment we're feeling like on top of the world, the next moment we feel like we're getting crushed by the world, and one moment we're, we're getting affirmation from a friend, and the next moment we're getting backstabbed by a friend. One moment we have this, like we see social media and we think there's hope for the world. Next moment we see social media and we think that the world is gone and lost. Like we know, like emotions just hit us. How do I do, how do I have genuine care for other people's when I can't even deal with mine? Well, I'm going to unpack, I'm going to share just a quick thought on that. Uh, in just a moment, but let me continue. It's to say that one is, it's also one who interacts with others in a way that leaves them feeling safe and cared for. And as though they have a connection based on trust. It's the individual, it's the leader, it's the influencer where you can have a conversation with someone, be it your, your, friend, your family member, your teammate, your spouse, uh, your colleague, and, and you walk away from the conversation and they feel safe. They feel heard. They feel cared for. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the statements, uh, most times people won't remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. Uh, I can't tell you how many, like, the best sermons in the world, I don't remember, like, as a high schooler, I remember some of the best sermons that, like, impacted my life for Jesus, and I really don't remember anything they said, but man, I remember how that, that pastor made me feel seen, and made me feel validated, and made me feel like my, my, my life is worth something in Jesus. Or when I sat in, in a class in college and, and a professor just spoke truth. And I, honestly, I don't remember 90% of what, what my college professor says. But I remember how they, 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 they spoke with such passion. It made me want to go do something about it myself. Like, people, unfortunately, rarely remember what you said, but they remember how you made them feel. So if you can make someone feel safe and cared for, and have a connection based on trust, that's, what, that's a part of what empathy is. Not saying, please don't hear me say, don't, you're what, the actual words you say and what we do is doesn't really matter. Otherwise, a bunch of us pastors and communicators will get really depressed uh, if you don't remember uh, much of what we say when, we, when you walk out the door. Even though there's some truth that we don't want to say, we don't want to take a lacking on what we say, but we do need to make sure we understand people, how they feel truly, truly does matter. Empathy is a key element of servant leadership. As well, although not all empathetic leaders practice servant leadership. So here's where there's a splicing that we need to acknowledge, is that uh, I would say that within servant leadership, empathy is present. But just because you're an empathetic person doesn't mean you're a servant leader. 
It just means that you, you feel other people's emotions really well, and maybe sometimes too much or too well. So we need to acknowledge that just having empathy is not enough. It's this idea of, I am a servant in my leadership. And if we can connect empathy with servanthood, that's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where, that's where sparks start flying. That's where growth starts going. That's where synergy starts impacting, where, where, uh, where service, servanthood, and empathy comes together. Here's a very interesting stat. You might not be able to read this fully. Let me go ahead and read it for you. Employees at the very top. Employees believe empathy is, an import, is important in the workspace, but don't always see it from their colleagues. So the first question is this. How, many, uh, how important do you see empathy as a uh, essential workplace skill. Uh, 86% of people said empathy is an essential workplace skill, uh, but uh, 42% say I feel empathy being displayed in my workspace. So 86% of people say it's very vitally important, but only 4 out of 10 people actually see it happen in their workspace. So what about you? What, what about your workspace? Uh, do you see empathy there? Are you a reason that there is not empathy? We need to take this thing, this thing called empathy seriously. Why? Because in order for employees to feel comfortable in the workplace, empathy must be one of the, be one of the most fundamental assets. And when I say workspace, I'm, I'm bridging that again to any, any sphere of influence that you may have. A leader that shows empathy to his or her team will have a team that demonstrates empathy and trust from the inside out. So again, you model what you reproduce who you are. So if you are showing empathy, you're modeling it to your team. Are you choosing to model it to your team so that they can also demonstrate empathy as well. The team will feel a sense of love and belonging on the team and its mission. If you're on a team or organization, you probably have like a mission statement or a vision statement or a set of values that you ascribe to and then you walk towards and you run towards as a team. And if you are, if their team, if your team members are, are feeling this empathy and this drive of relational equity together, uh, there is a sense of we're going after this mission together. We feel a part of it. We feel a part of the cause and we have buy-in. So the question is, are you, are you bringing buy-in to your team members through empathy? The mission statement is great, but, but if, you, if, you're not, if you're not letting that mission flow through you and you're not letting it be driven through empathy of showing value and care to your employees, they're not going to want to hop, hop on that mission statement. So are we choosing to do that? Uh, there's just happier and healthier team members. Again, that likability piece that we mentioned earlier. Uh, then how? And, and I could, uh, anyone who knows me for any period of time will know that I could sit on this for um, um, forever and a half. Uh, but let me just say this and then we'll move on because I want to hit some really practical things around active listening that Todd is going to bring to you and then I'll bring some after this. But first and foremost, I need to say this. Um, Practicing self-care is pursuing an inner healthiness. You can only be led as far as you you can only lead as far as you've been led yourself. You can only lead as far as you've been led yourself. So are you practicing self-care? Are, are you listening to the Holy Spirit in your life? Are you listening to mentors in your life? Are you listening to coaches? Are you listening to uh, uh, people who you respect and admire and look up to? Are you listening to your soul if you are burning the fuse on both ends and, and your body is having panic attacks because you are so tired all the time? Are you practicing self-care, pursuing inner healthiness? You can only lead others as far as you've been led yourself. Another way to phrase it is this, is that you can only lead others in healthiness as far as you've been led into healthiness yourself. A whole, like, there, there's, a, there's a book I just recently read uh, by Peter Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, and it absolutely, like, wrecked me. Um, a phenomenal book if you want a book on uh, learning about personal uh, tending to your own soul and understanding how your, 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 your leadership is important, but your soul is even more important. Uh, Emotional Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro, a phenomenal book. So are we choosing to practice healthiness ourselves, Guys, I know 
it is so easy to say, I'm going to go lead people, and, I'm, and especially in the name of Jesus, I'm going to go and do all the work of the kingdom. Yes, champion it. Praise God. Let's go. But you can't do it at the expense of your own soul, your unhealthiness, your family, your intimacy with Jesus. So the question I want you to ask yourself is this, is how is my mental and emotional state affecting my performance as a leader? This is a great going to bed question. <laughs> how is my mental and emotional state affecting my performance? But come on, gang, we got to ask that question. If you're, not, if you're not willing to wrestle with this question, I would potentially argue that maybe there's some unhealthiness if you're unwilling to wrestle with this question. What are, my cope, what, are my, what are healthy coping skills you need to keep yourself an emotionally and healthy leader? There's a lot of ways that we can cope with our leadership and we can cope with trauma, as Todd talked about earlier. There's a lot of unhealthy ways to do that. What are healthy ways to cope? To keep your emotional and mental state in a, in a, in a healthy space, not perfect. <laughs> You're going to stress yourself out. Don't you dare try to be perfect. Don't you dare try to have it all together at all times. That's not possible. But to have the intentionality, say, I want, to, I want myself to be healthy and listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to my own body, listening to my mind, listening to my coaches and the people that's pouring into my life. I need to be listening well, not just hearing them, listening to them. How are we choosing to do just that? So that we are not the baker who never feeds themselves. That you're giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and feeding other people, but you're never feeding yourself. I know I personally can be guilty of that. So I hope that we choose not to be. Okay. So now we're going to get into verbal active listening. In, in my little opinion, I think it helps to be a good listener. <coughs> Excuse me. As we deal with our stuff, the stuff that keeps us from being good listeners. So maybe in the next... I have some curly fries, and they are really. The more we can honestly deal with our stuff that keeps us from being good listeners, the better listeners we will become. What you're about to hear, I need, I need to apologize. Every time I looked at this, I said, you know what? They know that, they know that, they know that. As I was thinking they know that, I'm leaving the house, and my wife says to me, be careful as you drive. And I said, hmm. She says that a lot to me. <laughs> I know that, but it's good to be reminded of that. I said, hmm. So I thought, yeah, I I'm going to be careful. So even though what I'm about to say here, I have to apologize because I... I know we know this part, but maybe it's just good to apply it. So, verbal, active listening. As we are listening to someone, five good things that we can keep in mind. One, as I said, I, you can't be here 
I, was, I almost said you can't be here and not know this. <laughs> just in case someone you, didn't, you don't know this, uh, I'm sure you do. You just probably forgot, okay? So n- number one, paraphrase. Uh, it will help if we can summarize their main points. Summarize their main points. Like earlier today, I was talking to Christine, and she was telling me, Today was a crazy day because of the sixth graders she had to deal with. Would that be an active, I mean, would that be an accurate paraphrase there, Christine? Okay. Now, she said no. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So, I guess that means I didn't listen, right? Hmm? Okay. So, So, that means I apparently did not listen to Christine. Now, we're going to talk about why I didn't, I didn't listen in a few minutes here. So, but paraphrase. One thing that's going to really help us is to paraphrase what that person is saying. Example, so what you're saying is your current content management system no longer meets your team's technical needs because it doesn't support large video files. Okay. <laughs> paraphrase from something that happened at Pepperidge Farms. Next, ask open-ended questions. Yes, I, I know that we know this, but we need to ask open-ended questions instead of closed-ended. Closed-ended questions are, you know, the answer is yes or no. Open-ended questions, example, you're right. The onboarding procedure could use some updating. What changes would you want to make to the process over the next six months? A a good open-ended question. (sighs) Wow, you said you ate a lot for Thanksgiving. uh, And maybe you uh, you said you want to lose weight. Uh, What's going to be the next process? in that. You said you're, you're struggling spiritually. Wow. Boy, yeah, we, we all struggle spiritually. Um, what do you think is going to be the next process in, in you growing spiritually? Oh, open-ended questions. No, I, I must have accidentally pressed this again. I'm having... Okay. What the heck am I doing here? Okay. All right. I'm not sure what just happened. Okay. I see what just happened there. Number three, ask specific questions. Ask specific questions. So you're talking to someone and talking about their workload. Tell me more about your current workload. Which of these projects is the most time consuming? Use short verbal affirmations. Once again, we're, we're good with that. Yes, uh-huh, I got you. I, I see what you're saying. Nah, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Use short verbal affirmations. <laughs> and I see, yes, that makes sense. I agree. Display empathy. Display empathy. Uh, just do what Tony just said as he went over all that. Yeah. yeah. No reason to, to add to that. <laughs> I want to stay his personal assistant, okay? I'm so sorry you're dealing with this problem. Let's figure out some ways I can help. Displaying empathy. Now, these five are five that we know this. Like, you're you're going out, be careful. We, We know this. 
let's just practice this. And even as I look across here, I'm, I'm looking at, I, I've heard so many of you people speak to others. And so many of you, you're, you're good at it. Yeah, you're, you're very, very good at it. So even as I'm up here giving these, I'm thinking, man, these, these guys, these girls, they, they, they know this. So let's, let's work on this part here with, with the five. The paraphrasing, ask open-ended questions, ask specific probing questions, use short verbal affirmations, and, and display empathy. And they really work well, remember, when, when we deal with like our, ourselves, our, our own drama, our own issues that we, that we have going on, okay? So I think next we're going to have Sir Tony, as he is going to Whoops, what happened here? Did it? Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay, I appreciate that, man. Okay, so I ask for specific probing questions. Ask direct questions that guide the speaker to provide more details about the information they've shared or narrow down a broad subject or, or topic. Okay, thank you very much, dear sir. Appreciate that. So, table talk. Which of, of the five do you need to work on? Why has this been a challenge in your life? Which of the five do you need to work on? And why has this been a challenge in your life? Okay, so... Here we go. We are diving into now uh, nonverbal active listening. And you're also, um, you're an astute person. You are realizing that uh, we have 41 minutes left of our seminar and we're only on page four. And you're like, what in the world? Uh, why do we have 10 pages if we're only this much in? Here's why. Because this next section is going to be the most fire hose of fire hose content. But it is the most, in my opinion, it is the mo it's going to be easy to track with it. But I want to give you a ton of information in a very short period of time so that you can just go back and look at it. Uh, and I'm going to, hopefully it'll make sense as to why it's actually going to be pretty speedy. Because we're looking at nonverbal active listening. Uh, you, the concept here is that you, you hear what you see. You hear what you see. Our, that we are choosing, how we leaning into what we are seeing. And what we are seeing is actually what we are indeed hearing from the person across from us to ourself as well. Vanessa Van Edwards uh, has written a couple different books. She's been on the Global Leadership Summit platform multiple times, uh, and she has said, your nonverbal cues influence by either enhancing or detracting from how your words are understood. So Todd talked about what are the active statements, what are the verbal statements that you utilize to engage with someone to say, hey, I'm listening, I hear you, I see you, but what about your body? What about everything else that's not your words. Vanessa wrote a, wrote a book that is halfly around our nonverbal cues. The book is called Cues. Uh, so actually what I'm doing is I'm going to steal a, every bit of content that's about to come is completely and utterly hers. She says, we use nonverbal cues to assess everything, capability, social skills, higher ability, and your nonverbal cues are either supporting your message or detracting from it. So we can't just think about our words. We have to think about what is our body presenting as we are interacting and engaging with others. She continues on, and she says, we're constantly sending or encoding nonverbal cues to others through our gestures, gestures, facial expressions, body movements, and posture. And of course, in every interaction, cues are being sent right back to us. When we know how to accurately decode them, you get a sneak peek into someone's inner world. And so on the next page, you'll, or on the page there, you'll see that there is a, a red uh, box there of a triangle that has the Q cycle that she has coined, uh, that Vanessa has. And so this idea of, of, of decoding, internalizing, and encoding. So we look at someone and we're trying to decode what, are they, what emotion are they trying to show right now through their body posture? What uh, are they showing? Uh, are they showing anxiety? Are they showing comfort? Are they showing... Uh, 
perplexingness are they showing um, with you and I'm seeing you? How are we decoding it? And then we're internalizing it and in turn we're trying to encode something back to them. That's the process. That we're looking at people, we're decoding what's going on over there, we're taking it into our, into our mind and we're decompressing it and then we're trying to encode something back to them. That is the process. Then also in her book, she kind of works through these four different sections of what is, uh, what are the cues that we need to think about, and she speaks in warmth and competency. Some people typic, some people uh, maybe range more on my verbal cues are, or my, my nonverbal cues are more warmth. Uh, we'll unpack that in just a second. Uh, and then some of them others are competent. We have a danger zone, which is someone who is not warm or competent. Uh, and then we have the charisma zone up in the upper right corner, which is your warmth and competency. So here's what I want to do, is I want to unpack all four of these sections in a fire hose moment, and I want to share all these different nonverbal cues, e even using my own, my own body right now. Here's what I want to invite you into is that when I was reading this book, there were so many times that she said something, um, and I started, I didn't even realize it, but I was starting to, like, encode the thing myself of what she was saying, of like, oh, if someone is trying to do a warmth a posture, you're doing this, and I just found myself doing it. So here's what I'm going to invite you into so that you don't feel weird if you start doing it. When I talk about it and I start doing it from the stage, you're invited to do it yourself as well. Uh, the posture or the movement or the hand gesture or the, whatever the facial movement it might be, you're invited uh, so you don't have to feel weird. Uh, and if someone else is, if, if everyone's doing it, then no one's weird. That's, I think that's kind of how it goes, right? So here we go. Uh, number one. Nonverbal warmth cue. So we're starting in the upper left corner uh, quadrant there. Uh, she says tilting. What is tilting? Signals of interest and curiosity and engagement and care. So tilting is this. When I am, I'm interacting with someone and I'm, I'm simply tilting my head. When you are tilting your head, it actually is showing engagement. Uh, which is interesting, uh, but it's, 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 almost like a life, it's almost like a life hack. If you're choosing, if you are tilting your head just a little bit, it actually signals to them warmth and engagement more so than not. Uh, think of a head tilt as a heating blanket. It instantly warms you up, but too much can burn you. And it's a great way to warm up cold interactions. Uh, so, like I said, as we go, please interact with these. How about this one? Nodding. Nodding to show agreement, empathy, en engagement, and get more yeses. Uh, so how, think about this for a second. When you nod yes, you get the other person to speak more 67% of the time. Check that out. If you are just sitting here and, I'm, and you're talking to me and I'm just like this. Versus I'm like this. Like, you know that that's inviting and engaging literally to 67% more of the time. However, check this out. Slow nod means this. Keep going, I have time. If you are slowly nodding, it means, yes, I'm tracking with you. I hear you. Keep going. How about a quick nod? It means I get it, finish it up. <laughs> Come on now, you've been there. You probably did that earlier today. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you if I did it earlier today or not. All right, so nodding is another warmth cue. Let's keep going. Eyebrow raise signals a cue of interest, intrigue, and delight. So this, is like the, this isn't like the singular eyebrow raise where you're like, what's going on? It's the, it's the like, excited, like what just happened, but not, not in a shock way, but in I'm interested in what you have to say. Uh, this cue is an eyebrow raise, not an eyelid raise. When we raise our lids to show the whites of our eyes, it signals fear. So check that out. So again, we're, we're getting specific. We're getting practical. If you go all big-eyed, bug-eyed, you're signaling fear. But if you are just raising your, eye, your eyebrows up a little bit, that's showing excitement and warmth in a conversation. Next one, smiling. This is an easy one. Well, maybe. Uh, a genuine smile increases and encourages happiness. A smile is pure warmth, a pure warmth cue that makes you more memorable. It also increases blood flow to your brain that gives you more energy and optimism. So if you're struggling with optimism, maybe you need to smile more. Um, just saying. Uh, there is a very important difference between real and fake smiles. 
a real smile reaches all the way to someone's eyes, the best way to tell the difference is that real smiles activate the person's eye crinkles, which is the, the crow's feet on the side of your eyes, uh, and activates our smile muscles. So that is a way to know uh, if someone is fake smiling at you or real smiling. If you see the, if you see the, the, crow, the crow wrinkle there, that's a real smile more times than not. Moving on. Uh, a smile, uh, saver smiles are smiles that take longer to spread across someone's face. Researchers have found that they're, they are seen as more attractive, to get specific. A smile that takes longer than half a second gives the feeling that you are truly relishing someone's presence, idea, or story. So if you've ever been in that moment where you saw someone, you were telling a story and someone starts like smiling bigger and bigger and bigger, kind of this like genuine, like I'm so with you and I'm just so happy for you in this moment, maybe you've done that as well. That's another type of savoring smile. Uh, How about touch? Appropriate touch increases the chemical that helps us bond. So appropriate touch, uh, coming up and touching someone's shoulder, coming up and giving them a hug, other things of that nature. Appropriate touch being the key word uh, that uh, gives, allows us to bond. How about mirroring? Mirroring subtly matches someone's nonverbal gestures or posture to show respect. So if I am, uh, if I am choose, if they are standing up and I'm at my desk, I try to, I don't do this all the time, now you're going to watch me, if you're going to you call me off, I'm not doing this, but I'd like to try to stand up uh, if I am, if you're at my, if you're coming to my desk. I'm trying to mirror your posture. If you're sitting down, maybe I'm going to try to uh, get down at your level. This is something that my, my wife is so good at. She's going to hate them calling her out for this, but she works in uh, an elderly community, and she's so good at getting down on, the, on their level. If they're, on the, if they're in like a wheelchair and getting to their eye level, that's mirroring someone. Uh, so how are we choosing to show warmth in the way that we are mirroring where they are at? How about competent cues now? Moving on, like I said, we're just going to keep barreling through this because you can now, you, you'll be able to look back on all these competent cues. Power posture. Using your shoulders, arms, and feet to, to take up space. Uh, cue confidence to yourself and others. So, so literally, it's a, it's a power posture of my... my My legs are spread out, my shoulders are upright, and my arms are out like this, Uh, where you're taking up space. The more space you take up, the more confident you look. Whether you're confident or not, that may not be the case, but but showing confidence has this this posture in that way, in a a power stance. Powerful posture isn't isn't just important for your perceived confidence, it's important for your actual confidence. The more powerful you feel, the more space you take up, the more powerful you look. How about this one? Lower lid flex. What is that? Signal, it's a signal of intensity, judgment, scrutiny, suspicion, intrigue, contemplation, or care. So a lot of different words into one, but that simply is with the eyes, you're going up with warmth, uh, and this time you're going down instead. That, sh- that is a signal of intensity, a judgment. It could be any of those types in between if you're trying to show competence in the way in which you look. Uh, low dose, uh, can make us feel the warm and fuzzies. Again, if you sit with someone where they've, they've, all, they've, they've kind of scrunched their eyebrows a little bit, but it's not because of scrutiny or judgment, but it's because I'm, I'm, like, I'm leaning in more with my, my eyebrows. <laughs> I'm listening to you. Uh, but a high dose makes us feel scrutinized and unsure. So there's a point where your eyebrows go down to a certain level, and you're like, um, I don't feel warm and fuzzies anymore. I feel like I'm being judged. <laughs> Been there? <laughs> Steepling. Steepling shows you're relaxed, grounded, having it together, contemplated, or committed to uh, confident in what you were saying. Steepling is simply hand posture. It's when you're, when you're using your hands to talk to people and you're going like this. Uh, it, could be, it could be a point. It could be, a, it could be all hands like that, but that's a power, competent posture. Subconsciously, when we see someone's palms, we're assured that they're not concealing anything from us. It's a great cue to encourage others to listen and think. 
Our hands are one of the ways that we can show people the most that we trust them. This is part of the reason why, personally, as a communicator, I love using my, my arms and my hands as an extension of my voice because it is a way to show and hopefully gain trust in the way that you communicate, in the way that you talk with people. Uh, active arms. Uh, fluid and intentional arm and hand movement that pairs with your words and tone and the way that you speak. So again, it's the ability that as you talk and as you communicate, you're using your hands to speak with you and for you in the way that you talk? How are you choosing to utilize your hands in the way that you communicate as well? Researchers found that purposeful, confident gestures improve comprehension by 60%. And some gestures are so powerful that they carry 400% more information. 400%. So your ability to use your arms, your hands, I mean, really, we'd say your whole body for that matter, but your ability to use your limbs to use with the extension of your words actually increase comprehension by 60%. So how are we trying to look at the competency in the which we use our body? Uh, we can use them in different ways. We can go using numbers, right? One, two, three, four. Rather than just saying one, two, three, four, five, using your hands uh, to do that. Uh, big or small, me and you, uh, like a, using like a thumb pinch. And if you don't want to point at someone, a thumb pinch is, a, is another good, great thing to be able to use. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't feel like pointing at someone or you feel like that could be accusatory in nature, using a thumb pinch can be a competence type cue instead. Uh, and then them versus us in using hand gestures. How about a palm flash? Or excuse me, whoop, let me take that back. The fish. Like, what in the world is the fish? Uh, opening your mouth about an inch, letting it stay open for a few seconds signals the desire to speak or the desire for them to stop talking. <laughs> I was in staff meeting uh, today, and I remember distinctively there was a moment when I was looking at Johnny, and literally my, my mouth, I just kept my mouth open for like three, four seconds. And, but, and it wasn't for him to stop talking. It was because I, I knew I had something I was just about to say, and there's other people talking, and I wanted to make sure I had a moment to say something because I had locked eyes with him in that moment. So it can be when you want to get, when you want to say something, I think, again, subconsciously you have done this before. Maybe consciously, but subconsciously you've done this before when you just kind of left your mouth open because you're, you're ready to say something. That's called the fish. If you want them to shut up, just hold it there forever and ever. Um, not really. Don't. That's not nice. Uh, the bookmark. Holding up your fingers and tucking your thumb in signals that you are not done talking yet. Personally, I don't really like this one, but it was in the book, so I felt compelled to put it in here as well. Uh, again, rather than putting up a full, like, uh, uh, you know, hand in their face, it's just another way to, like, say, it's another way to use... Uh, I'm not done talking yet. It's a, it, it, it can be an effective, competent cue if someone is not being respectful whatsoever. Again, I, not one I'm not crazy fond of. At the same time, uh, it can work. The anchor. Uh, touching someone on the shoulder, arm to signal subtly if they are in deep monologue, verbal thoughts. I, I'm sorry, Mary Beth. Um, I love you so much. Um, <laughs> Because there's been some moments, I'm a talker, go figure, who to thunk it? And I can just go into deep monologue thoughts. Not, I mean, hopefully not too often, but sometimes she'll just come right up to me, put her hand on my shoulder or my back, and what does that do? That signals, it's, it, we've actually talked about this. It's actually a helpful signal for me to remember, hey, you're talking way too much, please shut up. Um, <laughs> uh, we have, a, we have other, je we actually have other nonverbal gestures to each other that actually help us communicate to each other when we're in public. Because I know how much of an extrovert I am, how much of an introvert she is, so I have to be careful with we're not spending hours of time together. So we actually have some uh, nonverbal gestures that we utilize to interact with each other uh, in that way. Because that's a help to anchor you back to, okay, what's the point here? What are we doing? How are we making sure that we are on the same page? Uh, how about uh, the power pause? Creating a moment of silence to create intrigue or suspense right before an important point. I call it a strategic pause. The ability to just pause. When someone is talking, you're in a meeting, you're in a dialogue, and you really want someone to get something, you pause. Because a couple of things happen in that moment. If they weren't listening, it'll help snap them back into listening because there was just silence in the room. Uh, if they were listening, it gives them the space to contemplate what you just said. 
So the power pause is, is super helpful. Just talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking is not always the right thing. Having pauses is needed. Palm flash, using your hand to cue people's attentions, uh, like these different things. Uh, a pre-handshake. Uh, pre so our hands are powerful. Like, we, if, if you know this, is that when you, when you put your hand out to greet someone, that's the, you are signaling to them without using any words. You're signaling to them a pre-handshake, a pre-hug when both your arms go up. When you get excited and you both your hands go up. Uh, when you're telling someone to calm down, you're using both hands in that way. You're telling someone to stop. You're telling someone, hey, like, like tell me more. I'd love to know more. Uh, let, let me explain this to you. Uh, here is the whole story. Our hands are used for so many nonverbal cues. We got to understand that and, and try to see how can we maximize our hands in the way that we communicate with other people so that we have the warmth, we have the competent. Let's merge it together now. What does charisma look like? If we have warmth and we have competency, we then get charisma in our nonverbal cues. So what is, what's charismatic? Leaning, tilting your body forward to show interest, curiosity, or engagement. So if I'm in a meeting with someone and, my, and I am, I'm kicked back, I can't have a back to this chair, but if I'm leaning back and my arms are crossed and my legs are crossed and I'm just kind of like this, I'm not really, I'm, I'm showing disinterest potentially. Now, if we're chilling at our house and we're sitting on couches, great, awesome, that's, that's, that's different. But if you're in a meeting and you're just like this, uh, you're not showing as much engagement. Versus if, you're, if you are choosing to like lean in uh, and you're locking eyes with them and you're bringing your head more down into, the, into their level or whatever it may be, leaning in shows care, shows intentionality. Uh, and how are we choosing to do that? Um, Anti-blocking. I like this one. Anti-blocking. Uh, it's an open body uh, that signals an open mind, keeping your body free of any blocks, arms, computers, notepads, purses, clipboards, etc. Um, so I love, um, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not use the word love, um, I, tr I try to be really intentional about this very specific arm posture. Because more times than not, this can show closed offness, it can show disinterest, it can show uh, apathy, it can show annoyance, it, it can show so many different things. Now, I know that for, for many people, this is a very comfortable posture, and I get that. Uh, but maybe an invitation is to, when you're talking with people, to have your, rather than have your arms like this, you're having your arms out. It could be in your pockets, it could be, it could be behind your back, it could be other different things, but just to have them not like this. Uh, or you're having, again, you're, you have, you're having things that if, if someone's talking with me right, literally right here, I'm not going to talk to them like this. I'm going to talk to them like this. This is why when I communicate, I'm not just sitting behind this the whole time because I'm trying to have an anti-blocking moment of clearing things from uh, what's in front of me. Um, and so we're going to get to danger cues in just a second where there are actual moments that that's helpful or needed. But generally speaking, anti-blocking, how are you ch intentionally thinking about what is in the way of the person across from me, even if it's my own arms. Fronting, aligning your toes, torso, and top toward the person you are speaking to show nonverbal respect. Uh, this one was so interesting, and I didn't, I, it took me a minute to like fixate on this idea. Um, it, it's this idea that uh, I, I, this one is actually one I've, I've noticed with Kim Williamson and I the most because her desk is right behind mine. So when I, if, Kim, if, if this is, if Kim's right behind me and her desk is right there and she's asked me a question, what do I do? If I am, if I'm, if I'm going to answer her question, I'm going to first, I'm going to turn my head. If it's a quick question, I might just turn right here, answer the question, and then go back to my work. Uh, if I'm trying to show more interest in her question, I'm going to turn my body a little bit more. And if I'm trying to show full engagement, I'm turning my toes as well. So it's like your body goes with your engagement. So if you are looking to show engagement with someone and they're, you're trying to have a serious moment with them, it might be better to have your whole body fronted to them versus you're off to the side just like this looking at them talking. It shows less interest. It shows less care. It shows less charisma. Uh, and so fronting is a really specific way to show charisma. Um, and also, it's another interesting way to like watch other people. Uh, where one, after reading this book, I was like, "Huh, this is so fascinating." Like watching other people, if they if if uh, they're talking, we've all done this, so we all can be guilty of this. But like, if you don't really want to be in a conversation, your body is kind of tilted the other direction a little bit. 
and your head, you're kind of almost trying to lean out of the conversation. We've all kind of done this before, but if you're really engaged in it, you are full-fronted engaged in that moment, head, torso, toes. Uh, space. Uh, observing space zones, intimacy, personal, social, and public to match your goals. Uh, simply put, uh, that there's just four different zones in which we think about physical bubble space. There's an intimate zone, uh, which is 1.5 feet. There's personal space, uh, 1.5 feet to 4 feet, social space, 4 feet to 12 feet, and then public space, and just the way that we think about that. Uh, then there's the breathing pause, pausing in between words to get breath, to slow down, and to create intrigue, another form of a strategic pause. And again, not just the words we are using, but the spaces in between. Gaze, making intentional but discerning face eye contact. Here's what's interesting. When you are uh, it, staring directly into someone's eyes for a whole conversation is a little creepy and awkward. <laughs> Just, like, if, if, so we're not saying gaze like, into their soul so that you can pull out the lies and, the, and whatever is going on in their life right now. No, no, no. Gazing is this. It's actually this. You are choosing to intentionally look at their face. So for a couple seconds, you're looking at their eyes. And then the next couple seconds, your, your gaze is kind of maybe going towards their, their, their mouth. And then it's going towards their eyebrows. And it's going towards their ear. It's actually moving around the face, but you're showing intentional looking in the way that you look. And you're not just staring uh, without blinking into their eyes. You're going to creep them out. But to move around the face like a clock almost. Uh, the muscles and areas around the eyes are just as important as the eyes themselves. When we look around the face, uh, our gaze quickly dances from the eyes to the nose, to the mouth, to the chin, to the forehead, to provide pieces uh, form and assembled in our mind. Every time you lock eyes with someone, you both produce an important hormone for trust called oxytocin. Oxytocin has a number of incredible effects on our body. It helps us feel bonded and feels trust. So making eye contact with people, generally speaking, is a really good trait. Lastly, danger cues. You're hanging in. Danger cues. Um, if you want to, if you want to show danger or unsafety or uncomfort, whatever it may be, physically uh, distancing, uh, separating yourself from a person or object. So again, it, not rocket science. If you're feeling uncomfortable, what do we do? We naturally back away. So acknowledge that. So if you're talking with someone and they are backing away from you, don't keep walking up into their personal space. <laughs> Be willing to give them space as they talk or as they need it. Distancing. Uh, so this is stepping back, leaning back in your chair, turning your head or body away, scooting back, turning your way to check your phone, angling backward. All these different things can be labeled as danger uh, cues within distancing. And again, you yourself could be practicing these if you are indeed feeling unsafe in a moment or un, uh, needing to get out of that. Self-comfort. Self-touch, uh, ventilation, passi pacification, uh, or preening. This is just the idea of, like, if you're sitting down um, and you are constantly doing this uh, in, a, in a meeting. Like, you're constantly just, like, rubbing, like, you're, you're, like the eye up and down. Or, or you are constantly putting, jittering your leg up and down all the time. Or if you are, uh, you're feeling like you need to, like, scra like scratch yourself or, like, or pick your fingernail. Like, w those are all, like, self-comfort. Like, I'm not feeling fully safe potentially right now. No, they could just be nervous ticks, But they also are nervous ticks. So to think about that, how are you, again, it sounds super weird to say, but how are you acknowledging your own self-touch in the way that, or and maybe someone else as you are interacting with them? Um, how about uh, block it out? Uh, touching, covering, or holding the super uh, nastronal notch, the indent right between your collarbones, chest, mouth, uh, or eyes. So if you've ever like clutched yourself like right here, like you're kind of like this, uh, this is a sign of like, I don't feel that comfortable right now. Uh, or, or again, obviously it can, be, it can be comfort. It can be, oh, I'm cold and I, I'm going to you know, cover up my neck, whatever maybe. But sometimes blocking it out when you're, you're trying to cover up what? Our hearts, our organs. It's almost like we're trying to protect the vital pieces of who we are. So we cover up like this as another way of, say, of like a danger cue. Shame signal. 
uh, lightly, lightly touching the forehead with her fingers or hands, often accomplished by a look uh, down or the tilt of the head. So again, we're, you're, you're touching your hand to your forehead. That could potentially be a danger cue. Uh, then the last one, um, I think it's the last one, and uh, the potentially the funniest one of them all. Here we go. We're all adults here. Why not? RBF. Looking a little irritated down or mad even when you are completely fine. Here is the reality. Here's the fun reality. Is that some people naturally uh, without, they have RBF. And you're like, when the world is RBF? Ask your neighbor. Um, <clears throat> um, if that's you, uh, it's just intentionally, it's intentionally choosing, okay, how am I trying to make sure my facial postures are alert, they are awake, they are active, they are moving, etc. If you know that's you, you have a, a potential naturalness in doing that. If you don't wrestle, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't wrestle with RBF, then you're in luck. Good job. Give yourself a pat on the back, a gold star, a sticker, whatever it may be, um, and there you go. But that also can be a danger cue. Uh, just uh, this idea of that being that furrow uh, and the way that there are our eyebrows just drop in a resting position is a powerful, can be a powerful thing. So just being a, a alert to that possibility. All right, uh, you've endured. Way to go, way to be. Here's what I want to do. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna hop right into our one of our last segments. Um, uh, Todd, everyone, take a deep breath. We're gonna pa- we're gonna bypass um, this table talk question because of time. Uh, you're welcome to take a picture of that. You're welcome to write that down. Um, but this could be a, another one for you to sift through. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm keeping on time here. Here's what I want to do. Uh, we want to give you a moment to practice. Here's how we're going to do it. I would like everyone to pair up, and you're going to take a couple of minutes each to ask, tell me about your day. And as the person is telling you about their day, you're engaging in active and or in verbal and nonverbal cues. So this is a space for you to step into it, give it a try. You're, you're I don't really know if I'm gonna do it. Okay, it's okay. There's grace here. Uh, just, just let's let it go. Go for like two minutes each. Uh, so two minutes. One person is is just telling about your day, and you're engaging with them, and then you flop. The next person is telling about their day, and then you're engaging with them in that. Wait, so go and take about four minutes in total uh, to go ahead and do that. Go. Have fun. So we're going to end with, with some tools and some tips. Tools and tips. This first one, Pace, is taken from the life of a good friend of mine. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And... One good way, a good tool tip that he did, he kept pace with people in their conversations, uh, other than, than the Pharisees, uh, but, but, but with, with people who were real, who were broken, that he wanted to minister to, he kept pace. So something that we can ask ourselves, God, help me to keep pace in this conversation with this person. First one is... As they're talking, the purpose. God, help me to identify what the purpose is of this conversation. And even if they say something off um, a little different, like, yeah, and, and, and my little dog passed away. Even if we had a dog that passed away, the, the goal is, is to listen. So identify what the purpose is, then ask questions based upon their purpose. Jesus was good at that. He, he asked questions, even if he was leading people to eternal life, but he asked questions based upon their purpose. Yeah, so that he, he was so good at that. So identify the purpose, ask questions based upon their purpose, connect on an empathetic level. One of the best ways to connect on an empathetic level is, as people are talking, listen for emotion words. When a person uses emotion words, they're giving you a window into their soul. So they're talking, and they say, yes, I'm scared, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, 
I'm happy. I'm joyful. I'm tired. I'm ticked off. Any emotion word, they're saying, this is a window into my soul. And so you can connect on that level. So if you ask a question, you said you were frustrated or heard that you were frustrated. Tell me more. So identify their purpose, ask questions based upon the purpose, connect on an empathetic level, and encourage the speaker to feel understood. So I have a question here. How can we encourage the speaker to feel understood? There's so many ways. What do you say? Okay, that's one way. Yeah, paraphrase. How, how else? Nodding. Nodding, okay. How else? Hmm? Smiling, okay, right. Great, Kim, okay. And, and, and if they're, they're your friend, as he mentioned it, touching them, that releases, when you touch someone, that releases oxytocin. And oxytocin is a bonding hormone. <laughs> okay, you know, so that, so that that's important. And and, and, when, and when you hug someone, that oxytocin, the oxytocin levels release, and it, bring, it it's a bonding. It's, there's so much bonding that goes on. It happens most of the, most of the time. It happens in huge doses when a mother gives birth to her child. That's why oxytocin levels are off the charts. That's why there's such a bond usually between mom and child. Okay, and so let's end this with the triple A here. As you're listening, you, you, you want to encourage them. Something you can say, boy, I applaud you for going to your boss and, and asking for a raise. Man, I know that was so hard for you. Man, but boy, I, I really applaud you in doing that. I admire you. For, for being so authentic about how Thanksgiving really was for you. And I, I appreciate. So using the triple A, you know, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate what you said. Boy, that helps the person to feel understood. So two great tools that we can use. You didn't think we could, but we made it through the packet. Uh, so here we are. <coughs> no, that wasn't, a, that wasn't an applaud. I'm just, all right. <coughs> I mean, to be honest, I didn't think we could make it through the packet. So that's, I'm, I'm impressed myself. Well, hey, here we are uh, ending our time. I want to ask you this one question and uh, maybe write it down at the bottom. But like, wh what would you say is your key takeaway? We covered a ton of ground, a fire hose of content. Unapologetically, we did that. But what would you say is like a key takeaway that is going to stick with you as, you as you go to bed tonight, as you think about tomorrow morning, how are you going to be a, a better leader, a more charismatic leader, a leader who engages and actively listens with your team members, with your family members, and also with your Jesus. He wants to hear from you, but he also wants you to listen too. So how are we choosing to do that? I'm hopeful that in you walking away from this is that you, you take this whole packet home with you. And, and maybe there's a couple of cues that you circle of like, okay, I'm going to work on these over the next couple of days. Oh, I'm really going to try to try to compliment these, or I'm going to try to look for these more intentionally. Because uh, honestly, since I've read uh, Vanessa's book, that's kind of what I've personally been doing is I've just been more reflective on some of these nonverbal cues, uh, how powerful they can be and how impactful they are when I'm trying to decode, internalize, and then encode them back out. So maybe you need to circle a couple of these. I'm going to try it. Maybe you can take some of those phrases that Todd said of active listening uh, of what I'm hearing you say is and paraphrasing it back. Maybe you're trying to affirm them, but whatever it may be, uh, take one step. Don't try, to do it. Don't try to do everything from this pack. It's going to stress the heck out of you. <laughs> take one thing. 
work on it. And then work on something else. And then work on something else. And then one day, someday, you're like, whoa, I'm actually actively listening. <laughs> it's a skill, and it takes time. And no one fully ever arrives to it, <laughs> ever. And there's moments you're going to be really good at it, and then there's going to be moments you're kind of not. Because <laughs> we're all guilty of being selfish, and we're all, we all have our own stuff that we deal with. It happens. We have our good days, and we have our bad days. How are we showing grace to ourselves while also choosing to learn intentionally and improving within our leadership for the sake of our families, for the sake of our teams, for the sake of our Jesus for the sake of herself. Thank you guys for being present, being engaging, and sticking with us uh, in this time. Two things, and then we'll pray and we're done. Uh, for, the, for the people who love schedules, I have one more for you. Uh, we have our next developed seminar already planned for you. Uh, February 28th. The topic is leading when you are not in charge. <clears throat> it's going to be a fun one. Uh, and whether you, are, whether you are a boss or whether you are uh, subject to a boss, what does it look like to lead when, you're not, when you don't have a title? What does it look like to lead if you are a boss and you have a boss above you? What does it look like when you are not a boss at all and you're just following everyone's orders? <laughs> what does it look like in a family context? Uh, what does it look like on the team? So we're going we're gonna to unpack that topic in great detail on February 28th and would love to have you here. Lastly, uh, is that we have, uh, we have a podcast here at Gateway called The Influence Experiment. It's a leadership podcast where we just unpack topics on a monthly basis. Um, and we're on uh, Spotify and Apple Music uh, and on the church website as well. Um, and so if you wanted to join us in that on a monthly basis, every first Wednesday of the month, we release a new uh, topic. And so this month we had uh, Pastor Dan O'Deans join me and we talked about uh, postmodernism, which is a really deep topic to unpack. Uh, but if you're, if you're interested in kind of like the history of like what, is it, what does it look like to be a Christian in a postmodern culture of, of everyone's truth is your truth. Uh, like, oh, I live by my truth, you live by your truth, and that's what culture lives by. How do we interact with that as Christians? Uh, in, just a, in just a week, uh, there's going to be another podcast being released around hospitality and how do we do hospitality well. So we kind of cover different range of topics within this podcast. Um, guys, thanks for being here, and thanks for being learners with myself and Todd. And I just want to say a special thank you to you, Todd. Thanks, man, for being a part. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm your servant. Man, I, uh, I, love, I love to get to learn from you. Um, and just thanks for partnering with me, bro. And this is yeah, such, a, such a delight. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Um, let me pray. And then we're done. Father, we thank you for the space, the opportunity to reflect and to think, to critique, mm. to affirm, wow. to take the moments to pause in our leadership and say, God, how do I need to grow? Mm. While also saying, God, thank you for the giftings that you've given us mm. and that you're affirming in us, that you're calling out of us to live with, with courageousness and live with confidence. Mm. May we take both the things that you are blessing within us and the things that we are struggling in, and we lay them both at your feet to say, have your will and have your way. And may we take just a, one nugget of information, of knowledge going out of here to be leaders that are, are stronger, but not for ourselves, for you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we need your help. So help. Mm -hmm. And thank you in advance for that help. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.